I'm a DJ boy, going to decentral, making NFT from Z Files, being crypto poor but J Payrick. My name's Chris Rice. I'm going to be hosting today's panel. The Snowball Effect Brands Onboarding into Web3. I'm uh, the host of Rice TVX, that is a YouTube channel, formerly Rice Crypto, if you guys want to check that out. And I do appreciate you guys coming out to today's conference and attending Decentral and attending one of the very first speeches that we have going on panels today. So do you guys want to go ahead real quickly and introduce yourself to everyone? And well, I guess we'll start with you and kind of go down the line. For sure. Hey, guys, thank you for coming. I'm Ryan. I'm one of the founders of Mintrops. Essentially, what we do is we help creators launch their own NFT platforms with their own smart contracts. So anybody can come in, launch their own platforms across any blockchain with like a click of a button, which is an innovation. Um, we you know, talk to some of the biggest brands in the world, including the Disney's, the H&M's, the Oscars of the world, the record labels of the world. So super excited about this topic. And uh, I think it's going to be a great panel with some great people. Everyone, Troy Austinoff, great to meet you. Uh, I'm a founder of Zerp. Uh, we're making wallet automation software, making crypto accessible for everyone um, in a regulatory compliant way. I'm also the founder of Juice, a marketing agency. We spent over 100 million on behalf of brands per year. Uh, Web3, Web2, Web1, all the things. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan G. Blanco. I'm the founder of NIFMINT. Uh, I've been working with brands since 2009. Uh, been building uh, retail technology since 2014, been at the intersection of crypto and brand and commerce since 2017. And now what we're doing is building NFT commerce infrastructure for brands, uh, where we allow a brand essentially to uh, mint custody uh, their NFTs directly on their channels. Okay, cool. I appreciate you guys introducing yourselves. I guess that th the way we could start this off is you know, we're talking about brands onboarding into Web3. So the first thing that I would like to ask you guys is what do you feel like are the advantages and disadvantages of brands onboarding into this element? Sure. Yeah. So I think the advantages of brands coming into Web3 is like, number one, is like everybody consumes some of those brands, right? You got a Playboy hat on, right? It's like one of those things where it's like every brand that you recognize needs to play in the space because it is a space that's going to take over, right? We're all here for crypto. It's kind of bringing us all together. It's all Web3. But what it looks like on a commerce level is like, all right, cool. Hey, we have a brand, we have identity, and we want to get into a new space. And the way we can do it is one with NFTs, um, others with DAOs. But like the essential advantage of people coming into Web3 and you know using uh, crypto... Um, as an asset for, you know, their brand is that it gives them a new exposure to, like, you know, crypto users, people who are maybe not, com um, you know, uh, making commerce with them every day. And then they also have a massive advantage of being early right now because, you know, maybe if you started a year ago, you had a lot more leeway. You can kind of do whatever you want. And now the space is matured, right? So maybe if you buy an NFT today, you know exactly what you're buying. Um, and the, the customers are a lot more, like, you know, informed about what they're buying. And that's going to be a big deal moving forward. And that could also be a disadvantage as well. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's actually some really good points. And I'm glad you shared that. You. What about you, my friend? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting seeing brands, some brands jump into Web3 space. Some people, some brands are doing it very well and it feels native and it makes sense what they're doing. I mean, like last year, even I think it was Gucci jumped in and did like a physical and digital component. Love seeing brands do this. It felt more natural when they did it. It didn't feel as forced. I've seen, I'm not going to name brands, but a lot of brands did kind of cringy attempts at jumping into Web3. And if didn't actually take part in to consider like what actually happened with Web3, how to get the users, like the crypto folks on board. Um, and then I saw like even this past week, like uh, Budweiser jumped in to be the official sponsor of Zed Run, which I thought was like an awesome like, parallel between the two. Like Budweiser obviously does a lot with uh, horse racing IRL. Now they're jumping into the Zed Run space, which is, like, seems like a hand in glove fit. So it's interesting. There's a lot of opportunities for brands to get into the space now that, to your point, they're still pretty, pretty dang early. Uh, I know it's like the cliche in the space saying like we're early, but we really are. Every the brand, this, most brands are not touching crypto yet, and there's so much opportunity, even like in ticketing and everything else, to jump in the space to utilize the technology that is NFTs. Yeah, so I, I love everything that's been said. Um, the Zed Run, I think, is really interesting because you're thinking about brands from like a marketing perspective. Hey, like they can put marketing dollars towards the Super Bowl, or they can put it towards this game. Like that's super interesting. Um, the way I like to think about brands getting into Web3 is actually not even phrasing it as brands getting into Web3. Uh, at the end of the day, brands sell products to their raving fans who love what they do, 
right? And an NFT is no different. So we always tell our brands, don't even think about this that you're selling an NFT. You're literally selling a digital product, a digital good, digital merchandise. So, you know, I'm probably gonna upset a couple people in this room, but I don't know if you realize this, but brands don't need the crypto community to have a positive uh, NFT sale or NFT drop. So if you think about like the top beauty brand in the world who sells hundreds of millions of dollars and has hundreds of, uh, of millions of uh, people in their email is probably even close to a billion. Do you think they need to do a 10,000 drop with only a crypto segment? That's asking them to go for a sliver of a sliver. There's roughly 21 million MetaMask wallets. So our point of view is really, how do you make sure that you service your customer base and introduce them to crypto, um, but do so in a way where they don't even know it's crypto, right? Like, hey, like, Thank you so much for buying um, you know, this bag. Here is a complimentary digital collectible that comes with it. Or hey, do you wanna purchase this one more digital collectible that gives you access to these sorts of things? So in, in three to four years, I don't think we'll hear brands say the words NFTs. They just will be NFTs. It'll be what's in the background. That makes a lot of sense. And you guys made a lot of really good points. Um, when I think about the snowball effect of branding, um, you start seeing a few entities going through the door and taking advantage of this technology. And I'm assuming the snowball effect is more and more entities following that lead. And I agree with what you were saying about being early. Early could be a real big disadvantage um, as well. So wh what are you seeing as the main viability for companies onboarding into Web3, aside from what you guys have mentioned? Yeah, I mean, the onboarding experience to Web3 is still a nightmare for most folks. I mean, you're talking about MetaMask. I know they said there's like 20 something million. A lot of those are actually dupes, uh, multiple accounts per, per person. Uh, but when I'm, when I'm working on like Zerp, where like I was interviewing a lot of our customers and I was asking them, have you, when you set up your MetaMask, did you do it yourself? Or did you have someone else help you? Or did you at least do a gut check to make sure you did it correctly? And almost like 99.9% of people didn't either had help or they had a gut check. I don't, met very few people who set up MetaMask themselves. So that's the disadvantage of being early, we'll call it, is that the, the infrastructure and the tooling there are just not great right now. So if a brand jumps into this space, great. I'd love, we'd love to have them on board, but getting folks there is just, there's a, still a massive hurdle to get there, to get people actually onboarded. I think expectations also. It's like the consumer today, they're like, yo, if this is not done X, Y, Z, and it doesn't like moon tomorrow, like it's a rug, right? So <laughs> it, it is one of those things where you have to be very cautious of who the consumer is, right? And what this product you're selling is, the NFT market is very, very different from like a typical product, right? When you buy a product, you're consuming it, and you have like a use case for it right away. Like what is an NFT? It sits in your wallet. So you have to give it utility. And if you don't give it utility, like there's no use and there's no demand, right? So I think that what people are gonna be able to do is you know, set their self up for the massive opportunity that's gonna come within Web3 and crypto. But I think if they don't do it the right way, there are massive disadvantages. But that's why you need people like, you know, people like us, like to kind of guide them on what the future of branding looks like in Web3, right? Where like, hey, let's not like rug the audience, let's actually bring them some value, right? How do we put some IP in some games? How do we like essentially go from putting a concept in NFT form, like let's do some animated like series that's funded by like the NFT itself and then take it to movies, take it to merchandising, right? So those are conversations that film studios are having because it's like all about the education phase right now. And I think that if we break past the education phase, we're gonna have massive opportunities that are just gonna like be insane for everybody within like the Web 2 community and Web 3 community. So I think it's gonna be amazing uh, and the innovation innovations here, but if it's not done right, um, there is like a, you know, a major risk involved for these brands as well, you know? So I think we're gonna stay in web 2.5 for a little bit when it comes to how brands get into all of this. Um, again, asking a consumer to go through a heavy cryptocurrency workflow, like literally imagine a brand, you telling a retail brand to say, hey, I want you uh, to tell your customer who's ready to transact on your website right now to leave, to stop, go to JP Morgan Chase, open a bank account, fund it with dollars, then transfer that to a PayPal, and then go purchase your product on amazon.com. 
That's literally the workflow for buying an NFT for a brand right now. That, that makes no sense. We come from, if you're in the brand world, what you do is you go for one click. Amazon literally had a patent that's expired recently for one click. You have startups that all talk about one click. And now we wanna have a terrible user experience and call it innovation. You know, give me a break. So there does need to be custodial um, elements when it comes to this. You know, what we do at NIFMIN is we kind of operate like a centralized exchange on the brand platform side. And that is because we believe that in the long run, you're only gonna have maybe 40% people max who are gonna like actively maintain their own custody. And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. That's not a, a bad thing um, overall. Because again, if you are a brand and you are thinking about this, that you wanna create the next board ape, God help you. And I really hope that you talk to your legal about this because you shouldn't be talking about secondary market activity. You shouldn't be talking about future value. You shouldn't be getting residuals because now you're doing things that your legal will definitely slap you on the hand for um, overall. And, you know, we're, we talked to some of the largest brands as well. And, you know, they'll even tell us like, hey, we're not allowed to touch crypto. Can you help us? That's why they want a solution like what we're offering. Cool. All great points. And one thing that we were kind of discussing in the back before we came out here is just Web3. Uh, I, I really want to kind of get everybody's perspective as to how you define Web3, because I look at Web3 as a decentralized Internet, but we're talking about brands onboarding. So that doesn't necessarily compute. So what does branding and onboarding into Web3, what is Web3 to you? to you guys individually? Excellent question. I think that you individualize it and you see it as a concept is the best part. So thank you for asking the question. I think Web3 for me, at least from my perspective, is like, you know, the usage of the blockchain with the applications that we use today, right? And I think that comes with a lot of different things where it's transparency for like financial transactions. We have like transparency across like anything. Like you can essentially see anybody's bank account, right? Like 99% of my assets right now are probably across Ethereum. So you can see all my assets, right? Uh, <laughs> definitely not a good sign. <laughs> but I think that's going to be one of those things that like if we are able to essentially change how these things are done um, with the blockchain, how we do it daily, um, transactions like being able to be peer to peer on like a mobile level in Africa, which is going to be a major like development. Um, I think those interactions on a financial level, uh, level are going to be like the innovation that comes from Web3. And I think Web3 is just the assistance of the blockchain with like our day-to-day -day activities today. But I think it's like just taking them to the next level and making them a lot cooler, right? So that's what I think. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I agree that, um, I mean, Web3, the definition is that, you know, decentralized, uh, decentralized the internet and everything. But I mean, the way it's been used in culture and everything is basically just a rebranded crypto at this point. It's just a new way to say crypto, which is fine. Which um, is confusing, though, and that's what I was telling you. Yeah, it's, it's very it was, confusing but when you keep changing up the terminology. For sure. Yeah, things. there's definitely a marketing element. Yeah, yeah, I figure, like I would say, it's crypto's like glow up. Is like people started taking crypto more seriously, more adaptation to everyday culture when it became Web3. NFTs, like all these different brands jumping on board to the space to Web3, they're getting into crypto. Um, but, I mean, for the brands jumping in, I think it's super interesting. I think you were touched on some great points um, that uh, for brands jumping in the space, just getting into your in an opportunity for your consumers, your customers to jump on, take part, have your collection, build a community with your, 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 uh, your, your customers um, in a less forced nature, but also just the community element you're building around your, your, uh, your customers is interesting that brands, uh, I mean, you can buy clothing boards, show your affinity to brands. Now you have a digital way to actually do that now. That you show your affinity um, with your community online and holding your NFTs, holding your tokens, whatever it is for brands that you like. Yeah, I, I think of Web3. So, so look, it's been called Web3 for like probably like five or six years by developers. It's just marketers got a hold of it maybe a year and a half ago. <laughs> and so, um, which I, I think has been nice, you know, for the industry, you get the VCs coming in calling it Web3. They're all Web3 VCs. Uh, now, um, I think that while there are good intentions behind Web3, um, I hate hearing when people call it decentralized because most of this stuff is not decentralized. 
uh, most of this stuff is very centralized. It's funny, like we're centralized too. We allow you to take your NFT off of the network and own it on your own, just like any other crypto exchange, or sorry, um, custodial thing. Um, but it's funny because I remember I reached out to a VC and he's like, oh, well, you, you, you're kind of doing like this centralized, you know, version of this. I was like, yeah, so is your entire portfolio is, is centralized. So I think people overuse that term tremendously. What we're really talking about at the end of the day for most people is ownership. You want to have some level of ownership rights behind your participation in the network. And so when I think of Web3, I really think about it from the lens of decentralized like, blockchain like, crypto like. And and so it's not like a hardcore, hey, like this is, you know, not your keys, not your wallet, you know, um, et cetera. Because again, from a brand context, that there's going to be very few and far between individuals who are going to transact and consume uh, in that way overall. Can I just add one more? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So 100 percent, like exactly what you said. And I think it's like time that like we own, start owning things that like are digital right now. Like. I don't own my Instagram handle. Isn't that kind of weird? Like, I don't own my Twitter handle. Like, I, I don't know. I use these things, like, a lot, right? So it's like, if I own my domain, like, and I can have my own .com, do you, don't you think that I should maybe be able to own my Instagram handle or Twitter handle or TikTok handle? I think totally. that's what Web3 really brings. Well, know? so, okay, so everybody remembers Like Cambridge. a digital passport, in a sense. Yeah, all my digital assets. Yeah, everybody remembers Cambridge Analytica, Facebook. People were pissed off. Oh, my data, blah, blah, blah. You literally had people from their Instagram saying, ban Facebook. It's like, uh, it's like the same <laughs> thing. What are you talking about, right? And so... Um, I, I believe, though, that if you told people they got to participate in that value creation, they wouldn't have had such a big issue with it. Because guess what? Most people, though we're outraged in the moment, are still on Facebook. Maybe you don't use it every day, but you probably are, have been on Facebook in the last year or something. Okay, cool. And I appreciate you guys adding that. So Web3 is definitely a new source of economic value. It's a marketplace, new revenue stream. It's a fuel for businesses, for growth, and a source of competitive advantage. Have you guys, since you're working in the space and talking to brands, have you seen any non-crypto related brands get into the Web3 space that you think right now is doing it right? going in the right direction. And with that, are you seeing any entities that are doing it and not going in the right directions? Yeah, good good point. So I, I think what Nike is doing with um, Artifact is amazing. Like they are setting the standard for like brands, how they should come out, how they should release their NFT projects. Maybe it's not a whole, you know, forward focused PFP drop, but it's about very brand centric. You know, it's about what they already do. They have the shoes, they have the clothes, they already have the branding, they have the swag. Right. And now they put the crypto element to it. They put like the 3D element to it. Like that's how you do it. Right. And now you're seeing like Adidas. They did an amazing drop. They made twenty three million dollars in one mint in a day. But where did they go after that? Right. So I think what they have to do is prove themselves. But I think that if companies start going towards the trajectory of like, you know, the, um, you know, the, um, the Nikes, the artifacts and how essentially Gucci did the pair up with um, 10 RFKT, like I think that was phenomenal as well. So like if we start seeing more crypto native, NFT native like projects that like collaborate with these traditional brands, we're going to start to see a lot of amazing things. And there's some awesome stuff that's coming up that I can't talk about right now. The, the brands are starting to get smarter and they're starting to develop cooler things. So I think it's going to be better for everybody coming forward. So um, for me, Artifact um, and Nike. Yeah, actually, I was going to name similar examples. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's great. I think it's a it's a great point. Like a lot of the brands that are doing a very, a very good job getting into the Web3 space are doing collabs with brands that are native to the Web3 space instead of forcing it. I don't want to drop names, but it's like we've had a lot of clients from the Juice side, my agency, of brands coming in saying, we got to do an NFT drop. We got into Web3 and it's like, why? Like it's forcing it doesn't always make sense. Just because it's there doesn't mean you have to do it. Um, just because the newest trend online doesn't mean you had to do it. A while ago, everyone was doing Harlem Shakes. Now you're doing Web3, NFT drops, whatever it is. But like, you don't have to fall on trend every time. If it's not a fit for your brand, just don't do it. Um, but I think Adidas did a great job. Adidas with the Board Ape collab, I think they did a great job as well. Um, I really like the Gucci one I was mentioning earlier. Um, when it feels native and not forced, that's the best thing for like a brand. And when it's forced, it's everyone sees it's forced. It's a little cringy. And, everyone, and I'm sure you see on Twitter, they get made fun of a bit. It's rightfully so. Um, but when it's the collabs, I think it's the best approach to do it for all these brands. 
yeah, are we, we're only talking about the ones that did it good. We're not talking about the bad ones. Well, we can we can give examples of somebody who's going because I'd like to I'd like to kind of get a comparison. If you know, we see Nike and, and Adidas kind of going in a good direction. Who, do you see anybody who's trying to force it? Who's not trying to make it native? Who's not trying to make it more of a natural thing? And and you yeah. can definitely tell totally. that what they're trying to do. Look, when, when we talk to brands, we tell them like there's two ways to look about doing an nft launch do you want to do this like a super bowl ad one time get a big lift and then everybody forgets about you or do you want to do this like long lasting overall right and i think unfortunately there's been a handful of um companies particularly in the cpg space who have done it like a, a quick lift and done so like the pepsi mic thing for example um, you know you basically ended up creating something for crypto speculators uh, and so you as a CPG brand now have to start thinking about like your token value and like maintaining a floor price. It's just like th there are things that brands don't think about. And like, why would you introduce that complexity to your product offering as opposed to, hey, like, you know, you twist the bottle cap and like, oh, you won an NFT and now you get to go do et cetera. Like things that work into that workflow. Bud Light, I think, is the same thing. Right. Like, you know, they were selling them for, you know, five hundred dollars. And so, again, asking brands to create um, token economics and to start thinking about token economics, it, it's just so outside of the way that they do their business that it, it doesn't make any sense. I think that PFP avatars, like while there are a couple that I wish I had, I'm sure there's a couple of you in here that have them and I'm jealous of you, um, I think that it will soon be the smallest vertical in all of NFTs, will be PFP avatars. Everything else will grow bigger. The PFP avatars will still grow, but the boring NFTs are coming, okay? And boring NFTs are going to rule the world. You are going to go uh, buy a washer, a dishwasher at Best Buy, and you're going to get a Whirlpool NFT. Well, even a warranty in an NFT. That, that, that's exactly yeah. it. So that's boring. Well, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So you're going to get a Whirlpool NFT. And so someone, you're like, why do I want a Whirlpool NFT? You don't want a Whirlpool NFT. You want a warranty. And it just so happens that your warranty is on an NFT because it makes more sense to have the manufacturer information, uh, to have the serial number, to have all that information there in that NFT and have a cool image and an easy way to display it and show it. You as a consumer, never call it an NFT. That's what's coming. That's how brands are gonna get involved. If brands aren't thinking that way, I think honestly you're wasting your time if you're only thinking about this from a PFP context because um, that, that's gonna slow down. And it already is. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. It's, I mean, NFTs are the railing for what everything's going to be coming in place in the future. I mean, I agree with like the, the warranty side. I mean, I'm sure for like ticketing, like I know Ticketmaster, I know Mark Cuban's pushing it for it, and tickets for the NBA. And uh, insurance companies are looking at this, medical companies are looking at this for medical records and everything. Anything that's licensed, registration, certificates, anything like that's exactly. where the boring part comes in. But that's where the real utility, I think, yeah. when we get beyond this art yeah. bubble of the NFTs. Yeah, and utility is going to be major. Like what, you know, Kevin Rose is doing with like Proof Collective, it's like more like a membership pass where it's like, all right, it's not a PFP, but it's an actual utility to like a group. It's like an alpha group and now maybe we can buy some NFTs together, we can control the floor prices. Or even like what, you know, companies like NFT HUD are doing or um, there's a premint where it's like actual a software as a service, but they're using like an NFT to one fund the company. They're not going to venture capital anymore. Right. Yeah. I don't I don't recommend that, by the way. Do do <laughs> not. Sorry, not to contradict no you. Worries, no worries. Do not raise money via an NFT like that's the easiest way to get a door knock from a three letter agency. So do not do that. Yeah. Not, no, no security. <laughs> like I'm not recommending it as a security, but I'm just saying like in terms of utility, being able to like essentially have like a software that has like a, you know, NFT as a utility to access maybe certain things is going to be awesome. And I think that like that's going to come with software, that's going to come with content and the utility basis is going to be the biggest thing. So warranties and receipts and all that are going to be dope. Yeah. yeah. Can I say one thing? Yeah. Yeah. Look, we're, we're at this really interesting point um, that we haven't been before. And that is there are tools in Web3 that are better than the incumbent, that are better than the existing. So I believe that we are on the cusp of NFTs being better than the existing. So for example, if you were to ask any brand and say like, hey, do you sell digital products? They'd be like, yeah. Are you selling more digital products than you did last year? They're like, yeah. Okay, cool. 
Would you rather give your customer a JPEG or a PNG and password protect it and have them visit on your site? Or would you rather give them a file type that shows how many were created, when they were created, the order in line, the ownership rights, what access you get to those things, and it has an image um, that displays as well? What would you rather give your customer? Of course they're gonna pick the latter. So, uh, really, it just becomes about making it accessible, right? So once that becomes accessible, why would you want to give your customer a JPEG or a PNG? The, the better solution happens to be an NFT. It's not about building stuff to welcome people into blockchain or onboard people into Web3. Like, that's bullshit. Like, did, was there, like, a big white paper for Facebook or a big white paper for Gmail? Like, no, right? Like, there's no need to onboard people into Web3. The product has to be good enough that consumers want to use it. Awesome. You got anybody have anything else they want to add? If not, I'm going to have you just reintroduce yourself since we have probably 10 times, 100 times more people when we started. <laughs> So Yo, shout out to the late bloomers. You guys are amazing. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we appreciate everybody for coming out. Uh, we started maybe 25 minutes ago, 28 minutes ago. So I'm just going to have these guys reintroduce themselves where you can find them, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. So I'm Ryan Kamar. Um, I'm the founder of Mintrops. Um, and if, what we do is essentially being able to like allow creators to launch their own NFT smart contracts, their DAO uh, smart contracts across any blockchain with like a click of a button. Uh, we work with some of the biggest companies in the world, um, some amazing creators, and we're looking to, you know, helping the next generation of creators like yourselves or the consumers actually get affected by Web3 in a positive way. So you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Ryan Kumar, NFT, super simple. Company name is Mintrops, M-I-N-T, drops with a Z, because you got a mint and you drop, you feel me? So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. I feel you. Uh, hey, Trey Ostinoff, uh, founder of Zerp. Uh, we're making wallet automation software to make it so DeFi is accessible for everyone. Uh, Zerp.com, also the founder of, of Juice, a marketing agency spending over $100 million on behalf of brands, Web3 space, Web2. Uh, if you want to find me, Twitter at Yo and Instagram at Troy. Is that Yo like the Yo app? I wish. Oh, okay. Does everybody remember Actually, the no, Yo I don't app? Wish yo, gone. yo, Yo, Yo. They okay, try to sorry. buy it though. <laughs> awesome. Um, Chris, awesome job leading this panel. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jonathan G. Blanco. I'm the founder and CEO of Niftment. We build NFT commerce infrastructure for brands. Basically, that allows them to mint, sell, and custody NFTs directly on their e-com platform. And we handle all the heavy lifting, all the crypto. Uh, I'll be up here. Um, if you uh, actually have a card, if anybody wants to kind of see how it works, you can scan the QR code and take a look at the NFT. Well, gentlemen, I thank you for participating. Uh, my name is Chris Rice, and I'm the host of the Rice TVX YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out. You can find me pretty much everywhere at Rice TVX. And I do appreciate you guys. Make some noise for these gentlemen. Make some noise for yourself. That's great. Yeah, make some noise for yourselves for coming out to Austin and attending these events. I do appreciate you guys for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Chris. You're amazing. Thank you.